was to summarize Ridley Scott's works in one sentence, it could be something like A man traumatized by watching a natural childbirth is having nightmares. Scott dives deep into the black ocean of feminine chaos and explores it ceaselessly. The masculine characters are often barely there, compared to the developed feminine heroines. It is especially the case in the alien universe, where we see these themes most fleshed out, literally, in the slimy, oozing, ovoid cauldron topped with the organic art of H.R. Geiger. Naturally, the aspect that stands out in a particularly stark way is the carnal aspect of motherhood in all its shades and faces, from caring, nurturing and establishing an almost telekinetic connection with one's offspring to the darkest fears of losing one's life, being drained of all the blood, milk or any other nutritious fluid and dying. When you combine these explorations with the vision of Aaron Guzikowski, a screenwriter whose Polish Catholic upbringing tends to surface in his works, although he doesn't practice the faith, what you get is Raised by Wolves. By listening to the intro song, we already know that we will be dealing with the creation myth, the door that finally opens, lets the light from above spill out on the floor below, and love pulls one from the sky and one from the ground so that a symbol can be born. The series is not finished yet. We are midway into the second season, so the symbolic analysis will have to be fragmentary and partially speculative. For the time being, it looks like we are dealing with cycles of creation, so that the human life on Earth may have originated on the distant Kepler-22b, where all of the action is taking place now. It fits into the current trend of seeing the angels and demons as, in fact, extraterrestrials, and that the heaven is physically above us, there in the sky, however far away. Yet Kepler-22b seems like a really upside-down world, where time goes backwards and everything's devolving. The basic premise is that Earth has been destroyed by an artificial conflict, where on the one side we have a tired mockery of the Catholic Church, Hollywood doesn't seem to get enough of beating the dead horse of their vision of the church, with its masses, Eucharist, baptism and rosary. Their antagonists are no less mockingly presented atheists. I say this conflict is artificial, as there aren't two different visions of the world clashing, as both sides are extremely rigid and oppressive hierarchies, with their dogma, rites and symbols. In fact, it is hard to pinpoint any significant differences between the two, apart from the very superficial signifiers used. The sun-worshipping church of Mitra is an unforgivingly autocratic organization, while the atheists present themselves as a collective, but are led by an omni omniscient big brother-like AI, not in any way less dystopian than their enemies. Thus, the actual conflict lies between these two deadly structures, those toxic masculinities, and the indefinable spirituality of just being human and believing in the indeterminable something displayed by the main characters, often swinging between the metraic and atheist sides. Nothing new for a Hollywood production. Wait, I've seen this symbol before. Anyway, the mainest character is creatively called the Mother, and she is an android that is everything what's dark about the feminine. The spider-like caregiver, the poisonous nurturer, the scary protector, and also Lamia, Lilith, Medusa, Banshee. The one that she is not is Succubus. Her fertility is disconnected from seduction and sexuality. Why is this the case? Although the mother and the father arriving on Kepler 22b may appear as Adam and Eve at the beginning, by the middle of the season, we see that she is going to be the mock new 
Eve as she finds a pod where she can enter the virtual reality and is met there by her creator, who tells her that she found favor with him and that she is so full of grace that he will do anything for her. And thus she finds herself not only a virgin and an android, but also miraculously pregnant. While all her other children were there merely to prepare her, this new child is supposed to bring the new era for humanity, so it can start anew in peace. So, after looking for a proper place where the child could be born and finding a cozy grotto, the mother gives birth through her mouth to a flying serpent. Although horrified at first, the android later grows fond of and attached to the snake. At the same time, a formerly atheist character who put on the face of a believer converts to Mitraism, but ultimately sets up a new, all-welcoming church where everyone's equal and there are no demands regarding one's mode of being. Kinda like a megachurch of sorts. To fulfill his destiny of a prophet, he is trying to plant the tree of knowledge in order to eat its fruit and have his eyes opened. With all this coming together, we can see something like a formation of an anti-trinity, the dragon, the beast and the false prophet. But it might be too early to be sure how all this is going to play out. What we definitely do see is how this story is using all the Christian stories and symbols and tries to build this dark, upside-down version of Christianity where the darkest aspects of the masculine and the feminine meet in a wicked creation of the new world. I hope you found this at least a bit satisfactory. Please let me know if you wish any particular symbols from this series analyzed, like the pentagrams or the serpent being the seventh child. So maybe I can do it in the form of video shorts. After the whole show comes to an end, I hope we will have a more full image of what is going on there, rather than a whole bunch of mystery boxes, as it was in the case of J.J. Abrams' Lost. Please like, subscribe, but most of all, engage in the discussion in the comment section below.